Uh, certainly not a very healthy relationship, but um, he also didn't want me to be open about being <coughs> HIV positive. He felt that was not the best location to be positive or gay. And I sadly went along with that. So for 13 years, I didn't do anything to support gay rights or uh, do education or outreach for the, the uh, HIV community or to, to do education in that, in that field. When the relationship fell apart in 2000, I was finally free to do all the things that I had been silenced on. Uh, became a volunteer at the local aid service organization, Aid Services of the Brazos Valley. Uh, I also uh, had all sorts of free money from not having to, to share your costs with uh, someone. And I was able to uh, donate money, donate uh, old clothes, which is, I was, let's just say that in 2000, I weighed over, over 240 pounds and um, wearing 38 waist pants because he always weighed more and was dragging me heavier as he got heavier. And so I was donating up my old clothes to their, uh, their, their clothes closet for other people with HIV. Um, I was donating food to their pantry. Um, so I, I was able to do more for the community. Uh, I was at work and I got this phone call from one of the case managers, Trish. She said, I've got a new client that would like to speak with someone who is diagnosed with AIDS, not just HIV positive. Would you talk with this person? She said, sure. And that's how I met Gloria Smith. Gloria was from South Africa. She was a master's student that came to A&M uh, to get her master's degree, to go back home and educate her, her people. Because she saw that all these people from outside South Afri Africa were taking the wrong approach. They didn't understand the culture. And therefore, the people weren't listening. Well, she found out after coming to this country that not only was she HIV positive, but she had AIDS. She was terrified. She knew what that meant for her back home. Um, she saw so many people dying over there that she felt that she would be facing that same thing. So she became the first person I ever mentored. Uh, I told her how to deal with living with HIV, living with an AIDS diagnosis. Um, the first thing I told her was, never panic. That was a hard lesson for her to learn. Um, because every little thing, she panicked. Um, in one email, she, she asked me, well, what have you gone through? I said, well, I've had shingles a few times. I said, but every one of them I can map to heavy stress in my life. So I wouldn't consider it necessarily HIV or AIDS related. And I was so happy when CDC finally got that, took that off the list of opportunistic infections. It's like, yeah, everyone, everyone's in, under stress. <laughs> you can't just say it because it. Oh. <laughs> it's okay, you can laugh. <laughs> Laughter's good. Laughter's important. All right. Right again. Okay. Maybe I just need to hold it. Ah. 
Much better. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> uh, I said yes, is it better side? Is it? No. That just tells us it's shingles. Remember I told you about shingles. Uh, now you know what to curse. Uh, it's too late for you to go to the health center on campus, but in the morning you go. If you can go get to the Walgreens or something like that, you might be able to get some, some uh, cream to help reduce the pain. But trust me, it's not going to go away that easily. Um, but she finally calmed down enough and understood she could deal with it for morning, and uh, she survived. Um, and um, about a month later, she called me, also in panic. My nose won't stop bleeding. So, calm down. Calm down. It could be something about you know, a reaction from the med medications they have you on. <laughs> you know, just do your best. You know, put, put tissue in, in, in your nostrils, breathe through your mouth. Uh, you know, maybe that'll, that'll dry it up. Again, it's too late to go to the health, health center, but do so first thing in the morning. But she was still sobbing. And she said, I don't know if I'll ever get home and see my kids again. In all the months I'd known her, she hadn't, she never mentioned she had children back home in South Africa. So I was trying not to cry with her. I didn't, I had to be strong for her. And um, so I made her a promise, even though I knew I couldn't keep it. I said, you're going to make it back home. And your children are going to come running up to you, throw their arms around you and say, Mommy, Mommy, we're so glad to see you again. Don't leave us. Don't ever leave us again. And I was so happy that she didn't make it home. And uh, she got a, got a really good job you know, with a really, uh, university and then got a better job at another university. She kept wanting me to come over to South Africa and help her uh, educate the people. And I kept asking her, well, where the hell are you in South Africa? <laughs> it's a big place. <laughs> but she never told me. And um, then, even though her, her emails were few and far between, they suddenly stopped completely. And I had no idea how to find out what, what happened. I finally tra you know, traced down the email where she mentioned the university that she was she got the job at. Found someone there that I could I communicate with that was in the department she mentioned. And he emailed back, he said, I'm sorry that no one no one told you, I guess no one knew, knew to tell you. She passed away during a minor operation. Well previously she had told me that uh, she and a friend had gone to buy lambs for Christmas dinner. And they were arrested on charges of livestock theft. Of course, over in South Africa, you pay cash. You don't get a receipt for buying, life, you know, buying lambs. And um, she felt that it was a setup because she was too vocal about HIV issues. And um, she was actually put in, in jail for, for a month and then had to go on trial. <laughs> and it was very sad to think that, that all that was going on in, in South Africa. But, um, so dying during a minor op operation, it makes me wonder whether she was silenced. Uh, it wasn't long after that that uh, Nelson Mandela announced to the world that his son had died of AIDS. He said, I know it's, it's a stigma to talk about that this in my own country. He said, but if we, if we keep silent, there will never be an end to this. But in the meantime, I moved to Austin and found my own way of doing outreach. Um, I, I was on gay.com chat, um, in case I didn't realize I'm gay. <laughs> um, but uh, my profile said that I was, pos I was positive and how long I've been positive. And my bio line in chat mentioned that I was open to anyone who had questions of any sort related to HIV. Well, I'd stay locked in during overnight, and occasionally in the morning I'd wake up and there'd be a message from someone, usually just a word like hi. <laughs> and I'd email them back, did you have a question? Well, most of the, what I'd gotten uh, when I uh, was actually online myself was simple things like where can I get tested? 
did I do something stupid? <laughs> but um, one of the people that messaged me in the middle of the night, I uh, got a response from him. He said, no question. I tested positive a few months ago, and I thought that it meant my life was over. But I read your profile, and you gave me hope. I just wanted to say thank you. And that made me realize why I was doing it. You know, why I uh, wanted to keep doing that. And it's not official outreach. It's not an acceptable form of outreach. Um, I, I just finally dubbed it uh, at will outreach, where you let them come to you. You open the door and say, you're welcome to come in and ask whatever you need. And it's not in your face, but it did get a lot of people to come and ask me questions. Uh, it wasn't something that they had to reveal their face to me, but uh, so there was some anonymity in that, but they got the information they needed. Uh, you know, they were able to ask person, you know, personalized questions of what, what mattered to them. You know, is this safe? <coughs> You know, was this safe? Um, you know, uh, should I get tested? And if so, where? And so I provided them all the information that they needed. Uh, now, I thought about you know talking about you know uh, my uh, how I became positive. I might save that for the conversations, but I might also say it over here. Um, like I said, September 13th, 1986 is when he became positive. His name was, was Keith Harris. I can say it because he's no longer with us. Um, we met the night before uh, at the gay bar in downtown Bryan, Texas. Uh, I'd had, before we met him, I'd had uh, two glasses of Irish whiskey, which I still don't understand because I'm not Irish. <laughs> Um, uh, at least I don't think so. Um, and he sent over a shot of Amaretto, uh, and that's how we were introduced to each other. And then while we talked uh, that night, I had a third glass of, of um, Irish whiskey. Um, I probably should have had more Amaretto, but that's much better. <laughs> but um, uh, we had a lot in common. Uh, we talked until the bar closed, and um, uh, first went to his place, but um, this is mid-September, which in Texas is uh, mid-summer, um, and so even in the middle of the night, it's hot. Well, it was even hotter because he and his roommates didn't pay the utility bill, so no power. So we figured that, um, hmm, go back to my place. Or there's an AC. <laughs> uh, but uh, we saw each other uh, more and more frequently for the next month. I realized that his life, when he wasn't working or sleeping, was at the bar. The dark, very smoky bar. And I realized most of the people there were the same way. Here it took me 21 years to finally accept the fact that I'm gay. And I wanted to be out. I wanted to be out there. I was, you know, uh, a member of the gay student group uh, at A&M, and I wanted to do more for the community. Well, so I realized that he would never be that kind of person. So October 10th, I wrote a poem. I'm a poet, so I wrote write poems uh, more for myself. Titled "Breathless." Um, about catching the wind, which is impossible to do, but I did. And how I let, you know, was willing to let the wind go so it didn't die, so it could be free. Well, the wind was Keith. The next day I wrote a letter to Keith, ending the relationship. October 11th, 1986 was, is ironic to me because the very next year became national, the first National Coming Out Day. Uh, hmm, odd. I started a trend. 
<laughs> um, but um, I keep moving the microphone and it keeps changing. Uh, maybe I'll just be here. Um, but uh, it was uh, a letter that I never thought I'd see again after I wrote it. But it did. It, come, it came back to me. I didn't know I had it printed out and saved in, in documents that I thought were all lost along the way. But um, three weeks later, I went to the bar for my first gay Halloween. Um, and I was talking with Silver Flame. She was a, a drag queen. She and I became, became friends while uh, I was uh, dating Keith. And she told me point blank that um, Keith never wanted a lover. He was young and he just wanted to have as much fun as he could. Well, I was hurt. I felt betrayed. My first relationship and he cheated on me. That was my perspective. I thanked Silver for telling me that, excused myself, and went home and cried into my pillow for a little bit. Well, then the poet woke up and wrote a very angry, hateful poem to Keith. I actually have it here. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's long and uh, it's hard for me to read because every bit of vitriol is still there. Um, I, I have to say it's one of my best poems, but it's hard for me to read without getting too teary-eyed. But let's see. Uh, I'll sit down. Okay. This is how it begins. Just so you know, it's titled Black Cat, subtitled To Keith an Eye for an Eye. <laughs> <clears throat> Written November 1st, 1986. You never leave a Halloween party before midnight with uh, dark feelings because, gee, all that stuff comes out the next day. Here's the first stanza. Panther prowls hungrily through the deepest shadows of the sub-forsaken jungle, hiding silently among the trees, waiting, waiting, ready to pounce when least expected. And this is how it ends. Until my heart has fed deeply upon your pain, and my eyes have seen your heart broken at my feet, speak not to me, for the panther prowls. I didn't realize when I wrote it that I was a panther. <laughs> well, I uh, put it up, drove to Keith's house, put it in his mailbox, driving away thinking I'll never have to see him again. Never say never. Four months later, mid-February of 87, there was a knock on my door. Before I even opened the door, I heard odd sounds from the other side. They were rather loud. I opened it up, and there was a, a man, very thin arms, almost like skin stretched over bone, face buried in his, in his hands, as soft, very loudly and his body just convulsing with every sigh. <laughs> then he lifted his head, and somewhere in that gaunt face I saw Keith. A word tried to force itself to the front of my thoughts, and I shoved it away. I, I refused to acknowledge that word. And then Keith spoke, and, and I consider his words to be my albatross. For those of you who have read the uh, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, his words are my albatross. I have to say them the way he did, at least in my best approximation. He, he said, no one come near me. No one will even give me a hug. Everyone keeps telling me I have AIDS, but I don't. I can't. I don't have AIDS. Well, there was a word I was trying to, to deny. But once it was spoken, I couldn't. Everything I felt negatively towards him vanished. Without thinking at all, 
my arms opened up, he fell into the mine, just held him tight and close. I felt every shake of his sobbing. I felt every tear drop on my shoulder. And I just held him as he cried. And um, then finally his, it subsided and that's that I could pull him inside and close the door and just continue to hold him until he's ready to, to let go. But he spent the night. The next morning he said he had to go to work. He never went to work. He left town and I never saw or heard from him again. Well, I finally he was able to acknowledge that I need to figure out where the hell to get tested in Bryan College Station. <laughs> As a college student, I had to do research and I wasn't going to get a grade on it. <laughs> That's not fair. But I found where to get tested. Uh, there was no free testing back then, just like there was no free content test back then either. Um, this was 87, 86 and 87. AZT was finally starting to come out in 86 out of public trials. Actually, I think September of 86 is when uh, it was almost out of public trials. Um, so even AZT wasn't an option back then. But um, $30 was the cheapest I could find, except the Brazos County Department of Health. You can get tested for $3 as long as you acknowledge you're a member of one of the three high-risk groups. Well, I don't location. I can't play the steel drums. So that was out. Um, didn't have track marks on my arm and wouldn't know how to draw them on there to, you know, to make them look right. <laughs> the third option was gay. Hmm. Well, I was vice president of the Gay Student Services Organization, and um, hmm. I guess that's it. So I had to sign an acknowledgement that I was gay, and I had no problem with that. Had to wait two weeks, of course. Well, two weeks, before, two days before I got the results, I uh, met uh, someone, Kenneth. Um, and when I got the results two days later, I told him that I'm HIV positive. And he said that he was, you know, stick it out. He'd stay with me and take care of me when I got sick. Back then, it wasn't if, it was when. I'd been told by the case manager, I suppose you'd call her, at the, the, the county health department. Um, rather brusque woman. Expect five years left to live. Maybe eight of you are lucky, but you won't feel so lucky because you'll be sick the whole time. Nice. <laughs> and, um, of course, having seen Keith go from healthy looking to not in four months, I have reason to believe her. I'm starting to think she's wrong. <laughs> Let's see. 87 plus 5. Hmm. Yeah, she's wrong. <laughs> but um, actually, it, it wasn't until I turned 30 and realized that 21 plus 8, I should have made it to 30. Um, I'm not 44. So yeah, she was way off. But. Um, I allowed myself to be uh, become codependent with Kenneth. I didn't want to risk losing him, even though the relationship was, wasn't very good. I didn't want to be alone if I got sick. So I allowed him to silence me on being a gay rights activist and being an HIV activist for 13 years. And um, so it was very nice that, that I was able to get away from all that. Um, but I haven't lost as many people as others have. I lost my cousin, Ken, in 2005. Now, my family told me to avoid him. My grandmother specifically, and she's the matriarch of our family, it's an Italian family, so you listen to grandma. She said, don't even talk to him on the phone. Because he may, may find out where you live, and he will be at your door wanting to move in and leave off of you. 
Well, his family. Okay, he was adopted well before I was born. He's family. And my understanding is family is important to Italians. But he's also, he was also living with AIDS. Either one of those is reason to uh, ignore what my grandma said, both together. I'm sorry, grandma. <laughs> I've got to do this. So I spoke with him frequently on the phone. Let him know that somebody in the family cared. Um, October of 2004, I drove up to Fort Worth where he was in a hospice and, uh, uh, and spent the day with him. I took him to see his parents' graves because the people at the hospice stopped doing that for him. Right next to their brass plaques in the ground was his. Uh, Ken, this is rather morbid, don't you think? I said, why? I said, well, your name is already there in the ground. He said, well, but I'm not. I said, well, yes, but still. It's the point. Uh, it's, it's just the, the, the principle of it. I said, though, I guess, I guess it could be worse. He said, how? But they could have already filled in the day he died. <laughs> and he chuckled. I said, though, I guess it wouldn't be too bad if they filled in a date and you were still here. Well, then he wanted me to uh, take his photo at the cemetery. I said, okay, talk about morbid. <laughs> um, so I said, if we can find a place that we won't get any tombstones in the picture, we'll, we'll do this. Well, there's a gazebo, vine ivy covered gazebo. I said, wait, let's make sure there's not a mausoleum in there. <laughs> Just a bench. <laughs> well, I didn't realize that I was taking the last good photos of him. A few months later, he got evicted from the hospice. Now, if, if anyone knows what a hospice is for, <laughs> I mean, end of life care. He got evicted because he kept ignoring the restriction against smoking in his own bathroom. Okay, what, are they afraid he is going to kill him? <laughs> he didn't take his oxygen tank in with him. But, um, so they, they put him into a nursing home for a while until they could move him into assisted living. Well, he finally got into assisted living, and um, I'd sent him a, a, a phone card so he could call me without using his minutes on his cell phone. And so we, we still talk frequently. And um, uh, he, uh, he told me that he had bought a pan while he was at the, assisted, uh, at the uh, hospice, but they took away his keys. Not only did that, but they, they uh, removed the tires from it. He wanted to get away. He didn't want to live in that, that kind of environment anymore. So he, he spent his money to buy a van, and they took it from him. Took away the keys, took away the tires. Like, are you sure it wasn't the Mexicans? <laughs> they said, no, they weren't. <laughs> but um, but my, our, our mutual great aunt, she helped him move into the system living. Well, she was also ex executive as well. He passed away June 10th of, of 2005. He got pneumonia. Sadly, they didn't tell anyone in the family that he had died until a week after he died. They didn't tell anyone that he was in the hospital for two weeks after he was in the hospital, you know, and put in the hospital for pneumonia. I was angry. Um, apparently there was some woman who sat at his side, not family. He deserved better than that. And I'm still upset that the family wasn't there for him. But uh, when our aunt went to, uh, as executor as a will, she was told that she'd have to pay his back rent. The two months he was in the assisted living place, he never paid his rent. She said, well, as executor, I refuse to probate this will. She went to his room to, to collect anything she could. There was a lot of stuff in that room that wasn't there when she moved him in. Brand new stuff. Well, I realized, though she didn't, he bought it because he told me that because I was the only true family he had left, he wanted me to have everything. But um, I wasn't going to push it. She left all, all that behind. Um, but it's just funny that he seemed to know that his time was, was coming. And so bought all sorts of things, knowing that it would be left behind even when he wasn't. 
But um, it still angers me that the family abandoned him. Um, and he deserved better than that. Well, September of that same of 2005, I lost a good friend. And September of last year, I lost someone that was very close to me. Um, and also there was an, a, a biannual event, the Cotton Street Festival. And I invited him to, uh, to join me. And I didn't think he would, but figured I'd invite him anyway. But he called me while I was out there. He said, I can't make it. I'm not feeling very well. So that's OK. I mean, you, know, you didn't have to come. Just uh, you know, we, hopefully you get better. He said, I have a temperature of 105. It's a shame. I'm not the person you should be calling. You should be calling 911. And 105 is bad for anyone, but someone with HIV, no, no, you need to call 911 and not me. <coughs> and uh, he, he said something to me that I'd waited over three years to hear him say. He said, I love you. And after a moment of stunned silence, I said, you know I love you too. Those are the last words we said to each other. And it hurts to think that he died a week later. And that's the last thing we said. He finally acknowledged that there was, there was an emotion there. And that's where it ends. Because then I realized how many people never get to say those words or hear those words. And while I'm happy to have heard them, I wish he'd lived long enough for me for it to go further. Uh, but sadly, he had complete, total organ failure. Kidneys, liver uh, failed. Blood was, uh, was congealing in his uh, capillaries. His feet were turning black. And the doctor said that if he went into cardiac arrest, his heart was so weak that they couldn't use the paddles, they couldn't do CPR, and that was it. And. Um, but he and, he and I had, had uh, known each other for, for over three years. And what's odd is, and, and it kind of upsets me too, uh, three years before, I've been telling about a, a film that I wanted to do, an AIDS film. And he said, well, write it down. I said, well, I can't. I need a title. I said, why? He said, I just do. <laughs> so I was telling a little bit more about my idea for the film, he said, there you go. What do you mean? There's a title. Well, I still haven't started writing. Three years later, I still haven't started writing. But the film keeps you know, building itself in my mind. But um, eventually it'll be good. When, of course, I also have my memoirs to do, as, <laughs> as Diane mentioned. Uh, but it's hard to write memoirs when you never thought you'd live long enough to have to remember that far back. Um, so I figure I've already uh, written up my uh, the uh, foreword to that, those memoirs. Or I point out that as a writer and a poet, I have a license to embellish. And actually, when I used to have one that I created myself. I figure as a graphic artist, I could do that. Um, too bad I can't uh, create my own degree. I could, but I won't. Uh, but, uh, and as a native-born Texan, uh, it's a law that you have to tell a tall tale. Always. Of course, I did go on in the, in the uh, foreword that, the, OK, there I go, embellishing already. There is no law. Just a recommendation. Um, but I figure that opens the door for me to fill in the blanks that I don't remember with whatever the hell I want. Um, my writing style is very humorous.